Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to read just a page and a half, two pages, and then we'll have a discussion about this and, and open up to questions. But I want to say before I begin that since moving back to the States, I've really been struck um, how nonfiction about foreign lands is usually about a people we should fear or maybe a people we should feel sorry for. And I wanted to do a different take on that, about writing about uh, a foreign place. Um, and the second thing I'll say before I start this is that we'll talk about contemporary China throughout. But this book goes back to 1995, when I first arrived in China. And the reason I did that is I found that when we talk about China, everybody knows a lot. And what I mean by that is if you're writing a book about China or writing an article about China, you're probably an expert. You probably have a ton of knowledge. And for a novice, for someone who's thinking about going to China for the first time, for someone interested in studying Chinese, I couldn't really recommend a good book. Like, how do you start? How do you get your feet in a country that has 5,000 years of history? Wu Qianyan, the leisure, as we all know. Um, and where do you begin? So I thought, OK, I arrived knowing nothing. And so I, I, I guess I'm beginning this talk in the spirit of, I hope you listen to me, not because I'm better than you or smarter than you. It's because I'm much dumber and much more naive, especially when I landed in country. So I'll just read a page and a half here, and then we'll, we'll talk. Um, this is the opening of the book. I'm an unlikely answer to the question, anxious, asked anxiously by a Chinese writer in 1935, who will be China's interpreters? Sixty years later, I arrived by accident after rejecting six other countries from the Peace Corps. I was fluent in Spanish and applied after a short stint volunteering at the Texas-Mexico border with the United Farm Workers, hoping to be sent to Latin America. The Peace Corps offered Turkmenistan, Vladivostok, Sri Lanka, and Kiribati. It's not Club Med, it's the Peace Corps, the recruiter finally snapped after I declined to spend two years in Mongolia or Malawi. You don't get to choose. Months passed until one late spring day, the phone rang in the English classroom in Madison, Wisconsin, where I was student teaching. My turf-warring comp ed ninth graders had been ordered to attend an assembly, optimistically titled, We're All in the Same Gang. I warily picked up the receiver, expecting the vice principal to yell that the students in the local branch of the gangster disciples were rejecting that suggestion. Instead, I heard the voice of the all-but-forgotten recruiter, who pronounced a single word with great finality, China. It wasn't Donald Trump, sorry, but it sounded like that, China. <laughs> It sounded like a sentence, although really it was a reprieve. <laughs> I didn't know Peace Corps was in China, I said, twirling the phone cord, stalling for time. In fact, the program had just tenuously begun after its planned 1989 start was shelved following the Tiananmen Square massacre. I was 17 then, and when I heard of the bloodshed via my Beatles radio, I pulled to the road shoulder and, completely out of character, burst into tears. I didn't know any Chinese people personally. I had never read a book by a Chinese writer. I could not have found Beijing on a map. But suddenly, a world event had punctured my bubble of enormous teenage self-regard. Six years later, I knew little about the country beyond the Great Wall, pandas, one billion people, fortune cookies, and the indelible image of a man standing in front of a tank. In 1995, China was more of a pariah than a hot travel destination, academic subject, or journalist beat. The country's ascent looked far from guaranteed. What looked preordained was its demise. One third of China's population lived in poverty. The average Chinese worker earned only $500 each year. 20 years later, that number is $8,000 a year. And less than 7% of people live in poverty. Permitting the Peace Corps to send English teachers coincided with China opening its doors to the wider world and its markets. Still, there were limits. When Chairman Mao held power, Chinese propagandists had condemned the Peace Corps as a tool of American imperialism. Rather than change its verdict, the current regime simply changed the program. Officially, the recruiter said, you'll be called a US-China friendship volunteer. He paused, and through the phone line, I heard the rustle of papers. I don't know how to say it in Chinese. I couldn't speak the language either, of course. I didn't even know how it sounded. Not only was I wrong about fortune cookies, they're from California by way of Japan. I couldn't even use chopsticks, but this was it. Peace Corps' take it or leave it final offer, China. Six weeks later, I handed the grim border agent the tissue-thin form that asked arriving passengers if they had mental confusion or <laughs> psychosis, manic, paranoid, or hallucinatory. A connecting flight landed in China's southwest where I would be posted as an English instructor 
at a teacher training institute located on a dead-end dirt road at the bend of a polluted river whose name, Tuo, sounded like the spitting that scored Sichuan streets. The province was 1,000 miles from Beijing, but really a world away in terms of development and engagement with the West. So that's where I landed, which coincidentally... Right. I mean, um, I, uh, when I was asked to do this, um, to, to have this conversation, I really did not expect to read a book in which I um, saw so much symmetry. I mean, I thought it would just, I thought, you know, white guy goes to China, you know, the, 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 the experience um, might not be altogether similar to my own. But what I found was that, you know, in the very first pages, you talk about arriving in China as this hapless, deaf-mute 23-year-old. Mm -hmm. And I arrived in the U.S. as a clueless eight-year-old in 92 from Sichuan. You arrived in Sichuan in you know, the um, uh, mid-90s, and I left Sichuan in the mid um, in the mid '90s, and we were both deaf mutes, completely, you know, who were, um, who didn't quite ask for that experience. Um, you know, you you know, it was you probably would have preferred a club med, and I um, didn't ask to be uprooted from um, uh, Chongqing, uh, the the city I was living in at the time. So in this, you know, strange way, um, what you capture in the book of what it was to live in this sleepy inland, um, you know, town has been lost not only, I think, to so much uh, to um, the world, but really even to the Chinese themselves. I mean, we were just talking about how, you know, when you, when you think about how the book will be translated into, in, in, yeah. in, into Chinese, many, chi you know, mess, many of the post-90s generation in China don't really know um, what it's like to have to bring toilet paper when you, um, when you go to the squatter's um, bathroom or that, you know, when you're on... Um, when you are taking uh, a train and you go to the bathroom, you know it, it's literally, you know, you know, you see turds, you know, on the on the on the ground. So I thought, first of all, that it was really um, it, it, it was a very very uh, pleasant and unexpected surprise to kind of to read so much about my own experience mm -hmm. um, in your in your can book. You, can you re tell people if they don't know? Why did you come to the States? You didn't join Peace Corps at age. I did not. I, so what, <laughs> how did you end up in America? Um, be, like many of your students, um, you know, that, you know, the college students that you taught, uh, my parents just wanted a better life. And the, um, the U.S., you know, which, you know, you break down into, you know, Meigu, a beautiful country, just seemed like the kind of place, especially in the early 90s, that would be overflowing with opportunities that you would never get in China. And um, for me, that, uh, so I was, you know, I was, I was luggage. I mean, I, I, I had to be, <laughs> I had to be transported along. But my memory of China in some ways is so, um, you know, it's most vivid in those eight years I spent in, um, you know, not only spent, was born, grew up in, um, in, in uh, Sichuan, in Chongqing. And it's very hard for me to fully communicate what China was like at that time because it's changed and evolved so much since then. Mm -hmm. But because you were there with you know, a writer's memory and sense of purpose, and were, was so keen on documenting, you know, those um, first days, mm -hmm. months, um, years, it was like, it was like reading through my own memory, if that makes any yeah. sense. Um, you know, some of you may be familiar with this. When you walk into the bookstore or the library and you say, where's the China stuff? And you just sort of see that stripe of red in the distance. You know, all the spines on the shelf are red. Right. And when I had done that before I went, I thought, well, I have to learn something about this. And there was a, 
an elderly librarian in Madison, and she was leading me like through the population books, like 200,000, 400,000, <laughs> half the world. You know, they, all those population numbers were growing as the titles went down the decades. But she had actually said, have you read Pearl Buck? And I remember thinking, like, Pearl Buck? That's like reading Charles Dickens to understand modern London, right? Right. But the funny thing is about Buck now is that some Chinese intellectuals consider her as Chinese literature because she was chronicling life in the countryside, especially in Anhui province, in the 1930s, whereas Chinese intellectuals and writers often chronicle Mm -hmm. urban life. So I knew, you know, even with that nascent understanding, I thought, like, well, this is worth recording. I had that sense because I had worked as a journalist before I went to the Peace Corps. I'm wondering, when you came to the States, was there a similar book or shelf in the Xinhua bookstore? Was it all like Poor Richard's Almanac or O. Henry stories? Or no. Was there... I remember the only English words I was exposed to was um, my mom had learned a little bit of English um, in China. And uh, she told me, this is what Sheng Zhi Le Happy Birthday um, sounds like in English. And my first response was like, fuck, like, I'm never going to, like, I was like, like, as a, this is as a, as a seven-year-old, I was like, I am never going to learn this language because it was just this incomprehensible slew of syllables. Mm. And I was like, that means happy birthday. Like, Mm -hmm. so it was real. um, It it, 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 it was with a lot of um, trepidation, I think, that I arrived. And, you know, a question I have for you is, you know, when I arrived in um, in New Haven at that point, everything seemed excruciatingly foreign. But I, as an eight-year-old, you don't know about socioeconomic differences and you don't know about kind of where China and the U.S. stands and how one country is more developed than the mm-hmm. other. Everything just feels different. It's just, you know, it's like a different color, but you don't have the idea that, it's, that there's a hierarchy. Yeah. So for you as a 23-year-old, you know, with little knowledge of China and um, going to the country, did you have that sense that, you know, you were coming not only into a different culture, but a place that is still very underdeveloped? Like, was the cultural, was the sense of cultural difference accompanied by the sense of socioeconomic um, uh, uh, um, decrepitude? No, and that's a really good question. And so I went with a group of 15 volunteers. And after you can leave Peace Corps. I didn't know that till you got there. You can quit Peace Corps anytime. They'll have you on a plane within a few days. Um, the 15 I went with, seven left in the first year. Mm-hmm. Those seven who left all had one thing in common. They had lived in Taiwan, Beijing, Hong Kong, or Shanghai. Uh-huh. So for them to go to Sichuan, it was like, well, this isn't the China I know. It doesn't compute. It would be like maybe you landing in rural Arkansas or something, right? I grew up in what was then rural Minnesota. And so for me, the same thing when I lived in a rice farming village in the Northeast near the North Korean border, it's kind of like, well, this isn't that different from where I grew up. Mm. You know what I mean? The the culture shock for me, and I talk about this in the book, was more like going to an extended family dinner because I didn't grow up in a house with an extended family. And so that was more shocking. Or I think if I had been a journalist you know, with a tie on in Beijing, having to go interview CEOs or officials, that would have been culture shock. But Mm -hmm. living on a dirt road with well water and pit toilets, that's what I grew up with. So it didn't feel that different, if that makes sense. And I also find, I don't know if you found this coming to to America, I find Chinese and Americans be very, very similar, actually. Mm Self-effacing, humorous, Mm -hmm. um, I don't know, love to share opinions, Mm -hmm. you know, different than my experiences living in the UK or Singapore, for Mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. So I didn't feel that that abrupt culture shock. Mm -hmm. I think more I felt the weight of Peace Corps made it feel like every move you made, U.S.-China relations hung in the balance. And so in the (laughs) beginning of the book, I detail, you know, I I was attacked on a bus early on. I um, had no, very little Chinese and I was supposed to go out in the field and practice. And so I got on a bus and I thought, oh, this would be great. I'll speak to people. But I didn't know anything. You know, I'm a head taller and two weight classes heavier than everybody, but I'm the smallest person on this bus because I don't understand what's happening. Right. And three men got on, sw- you know, swilling from bottles that looked like this, and they had long knives on their belts. And an altercation happened where they got very excited to see a foreigner, and an older guy said, leave him alone, and they smashed the bottle over his head. And then the conductor took the screwdriver. Remember, they used to stick the screwdriver mm-hmm. on the bus thing, and he stabbed one of the guys. This is China. Like, it accelerates. Very- Chinese are always like, we're really glad we don't have guns in this country. And it's like, <laughs> I do say, like, you haven't really seen China until you've seen a cleaver fight, you know, where someone chases someone with a cleaver. Um, but I was in this, this horrific incident rather early on where 
passengers rose to my defense and the bus driver actually clubbed one of the guys um, and, and killed him. I don't want to gloss over this, right? I'm like, um, but, you know, at the time, I remember thinking like, oh my God, what is going, like, I'm going to detonate U.S.-China relations because <laughs> I was trained like, don't offend. So even when the man is choking me, it's like, don't let him lose face, don't let him lose face, you know, he's trying to choke the life out of me because I was so, um, everything felt so delicate, do you know what I mean, right. after Tiananmen especially. Right, right, and right. So that was more my eggshell and it took me years to realize like, I could say no. I could express my real opinion. Do you right, know what I mean? right, right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean that um, that you know that incident, which you know you retold so well here, that um, that kind of fear, kind of as a foreigner witnessing crime and thinking, mm-hmm. you know, does Sino-American relation um, hung in the balance? You know, I I haven't. I don't think I've witnessed anything so um, horrific. I uh, in my you know my first in my, you know, eight years um, in China. But there was so much casual crime. And yeah. there, I, I, I remember being on one of those mian bao chu, which, you know, these, these basically little vans that was very popular in China um, around in, the, in the mid-90s. They would get you to places faster. They were less clunkier than the big buses. And um, I don't know why so much crime happens on transportation in China. I'm just, it's just, just occurring to me. But you would see um, a lot of times old ladies would have, um, you know, a gold or jade ring on their finger that's been there for, you know, like half a century. And, you know, their fingers are all swelled up. Their joints are swelled up. But, you know, it's that ring. And um, you'd see kind of maybe that that's probably the most precious thing they own. And, you know, they would be dozing off. And um, I remember being seven and seeing... Um, a group of men, they, they came on, and um, the woman, she looked like she was a granny, maybe in her, in her 80s, she was dozing off, and um, they were slowly trying to loosen the ring from her finger, mm-hmm. and I was sitting right next to her when this was happening, and um, the, one of the men also had a knife. So it, to kind of brandish to the fellow um, uh, uh, riders, like if you say anything or wake this woman up, you know, you're yeah. going to get what that guy got yeah. on the on the on the on the on the um, uh, bus with you. But of course, my reaction was not, you know, uh, uh, major world relations. It was how do I stay alive and how yeah. do I just keep my trap shut so that I can get off at the next um, uh, at the next um, stop. But it, you know, it did. You know, it did occur to me that, you know, there is so much, there's so much crime that just happens at a very, at a very, very casual pace, Mm -hmm. but which, and and you have to somehow deal with your fear. There isn't, you know, there's not really a sense of, oh my God, like, can you believe this crazy thing that happened to me? It's how do I survive? How do I get off that bus Mm -hmm. in your case? How do I get off the van in my case so that I can move on with my life? And I just do not have really, I think for either of us, we didn't really have the bandwidth to think, oh, the poor older, you know, the poor older granny who's probably being, you know, um, uh, 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 deprived of the most precious thing um, she owns. And for you, like, was there, you know, was there justice? Can justice be? (laughs) So what happened to me is, if I can interrupt you there, the police, this bus had rolled. The the driver had the the wherewithal to keep rolling toward a village, and the two surviving guys had gotten off the bus and had stoned it, and the glass was shattering around us. And all the Chinese passengers were like gymnasts; they went over the back seat, you know, all the way back to the back of the bus, and I'm up at the front. But some police finally ran down to the road, and. At that point, I had only read cultural revolution memoirs and Tiananmen Square recounting. So when I saw police, I was like, oh, this is even worse than the guys. <laughs> and I didn't know then that Chinese police are kind of like put upon constables in a lot of ways. Yes. Not like the Wu Jing. Like the armed police are the ones you got to watch out for. But the local people are kind of constables, right? And this incident ended with them taking me in for questioning and giving a statement. And I can't speak any Chinese. I don't have my passport. I have no money. And they got a middle school teacher to come in and translate. And mm-hmm. he was so thrilled to meet a foreigner. Right, so okay. he was just excited. And I'm sitting there thinking, like, if they're smart, they're just going to blame the lawai, blame the foreigner for everything here. But our statements matched and all that. But at the end of this, the way it was resolved was they said, well, we tied up the two surviving guys to pole 
to polls out in this courtyard, and they said, we're going to beat them until you're satisfied that justice has been achieved. <laughs> and the translator translated that for me. We're going to beat them. And I remember thinking, like, what a sentence. Like, <laughs> and then the cop, you know, wearing his loafer, did a penalty kick, essentially, and kicked the guy in the face. And I said, well, I'm satisfied justice has been achieved. <laughs> you know, and then you move on from that. And it's funny, like, I laughed too, but at the time it was like, it's so, you're, you're so, I was so worried that I was going to be in trouble. Do you know what I mean? More than anything that's else. So, that's so funny because, of course, when um, I had also, I think I, I probably met one foreigner, like one person who looked like you before getting on the plane to mm-hmm. go to the U.S. And, you know, in China at the time, the we were so insulated, especially in, um, especially inland, you know, mm-hmm. um, uh, in, in, in Sichuan, that in a very, you know, strange, I think, um, subliminal way, we thought of foreigners as superior, as superior people. Mm -hmm. So had I been on that bus, um, I would have thought, I mean, my thought would have been exactly the opposite of yours, which is, which is, he's like, even if he, right, right, right. And also, even if he did the stabbing, he's going to get better treatment than if, than a local. Whereas your fear is, like, I'm, I'm the foreigner here, like, I have no defenses. And that, I, I find that really interesting because, you know, you're there just trying to survive and get out of the situation. But for a lot of, you know, for, for local, for the local Chinese, it's this sense of, this here's a person from a superior place, you know, coming to China. They're going to get, you know, they're going to be the first class citizen and yeah. we're automatically going to be relegated to, you know, as second class citizens. So that kind of disconnect in perception, I find um, really, really fascinating. And for me, that thread of I don't want to cause trouble, I don't want to get people in trouble mm-hmm. runs throughout this book all the way. I don't know if you've had the chance to go down to Washington Square and see Ai Weiwei's installation under the Washington, you know, the arch there. Um, at, toward the end of this book, I, I go and interview him at his house. And I remember calling him and saying, um, I'd like to talk to you, blah, blah, blah. I was doing an article for Sports Illustrated, so it was about the Olympic Stadium. And he said, oh, come on out tomorrow. And I said, okay. And he said, where? Come to my house. I said, okay. And I, well, tomorrow's June 4th. It's the anniversary <laughs> of Tiananmen Square. It's the 20-year anniversary. He said, yep. I said, there's police all around your house. He said, yep. I said, well, and he said, what, you're afraid to come? And I said, well, I have a tourist <laughs> very, visa. Yeah, and he said, how dare you? You're an American writer. No one can tell you what to write in this country, et cetera, et cetera. And I felt really ashamed of it at the time. Um, but that's a thing that has run through a lot of my experience in China to the point where this book is called The Road to Sleeping Dragon because Sleeping Dragon is Wu Long. It's the panda mm-hmm. preserve. Yeah. And toward the end of this book, you know, I start asking myself the question T.S. Eliot asked in one of his poems, which is, did I have the experience but miss the meaning? So what is this all for? You've learned all this Chinese. You've traveled all these places. You've done all this reporting. So what? What are you going to do with it? And in the end, I go to Wolong, the Panda Preserve, and I try to convince the local officials not to develop the valley into an IMAX theater. And they were going to do a roller coaster called the Panda Coaster. Right. You know, and you try. It's a funny thing as a foreigner. You're always like, and especially as a reporter, are you just watching or are you involved? Right, right, right. right. And that's, that's the, so the end of this book is that leap to the Beijing book and the Manchuria book, which is where I get much more involved. But. Right. And I wanted to ask you about that um, because, you know, in the second half of the book, as you're starting to write more mm-hmm. for various um, foreign uh, publications, you, um, you have this very, um, you have this great line where, um, you say, you know, writing about China makes one either a polemicist or a patsy. And uh, that really resonates as someone who, you know, makes a living writing about China. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about, you know, in Ch- when you were living in China as a writer, what was your sense of, of foreign coverage there? And how did that, you know, and, and, and did that, did those perceptions evolve with time, you know, and what do you think about foreign coverage now? <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> that is a very- I will say, though, I, I've thought of this a great deal, and one of the nice things when I was in Sichuan is you could only buy seven or eight books in English at the Xinhua Shudian, at the bookstore back right. then. Um, all of Shakespeare, O. Henry stories. Um, mm-hmm. But one of the books was My Country, My People by Lin Yutang, who was a writer in the 1930s who was Pearl Buck's contemporary. Um, and he invented, the, he coined the Chinese word for humor, yomo, that's mm-hmm. true or not. Um, 
And he, he invented the, China, the first Chinese typewriter and so forth. Right. But he wrote this book that I'm quoting in the beginning, you know, where he's talking about who will be China's interpreters. Because China, it, writers about China are either its implacable critics uh-huh. or they're its propagandists in mm-hmm. a sense. And mm-hmm. which, how do you fall on this continuum? And it was interesting to me when I, when I you know, started to write about China, I would get letters from abroad. You know, from re- mm-hmm. This is back in the day where people would write letters to the editor and the editors would forward it to you. And it really was half the people are, you're being too kind mm-hmm. to red China, my mom would say that, um, or um, you're um, wrongly criticizing a developing country. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? You're mm-hmm. always in that, mm-hmm. that divide. And F. Scott Fitzgerald famously said, the sign of intelligence is you can hold two conflicting ideas right. at the same time. But he said that in his self you know, autopsy of his mental breakdown. So <laughs> I felt like in some ways in China, you always are writing that story like the Chinese countryside is beautiful, right. but it's also harsh. Right. You know, you're always filling in that blank. Right. And it's right. very difficult to do. And when you're working for a publication, I worked with Susie on a, in an unofficial capacity at Time Magazine. Um, she was an actual correspondent. I would just sit and use the internet. But you were always, you know, when you would sit in Time Magazine, even in the office then, They had all of its covers Uh from the very first covers all the way to the present day. And you could hopscotch through negative, positive, negative, positive, Mm -hmm. negative, positive. Mm -hmm. And I find that now, right, it's up and down. It's up and down. It's very difficult to find a sort of, I guess that's why I wrote the book. If if the book you doesn't, you know, the book you want to read doesn't exist, that's when it's time to write the book. That's sort of median. Right. And, um, and, you know, for, um, you know, for, for those of you who do read, you know, China, um, China coverage and various publications. You, you you detail this relationship between the foreign correspondents in China and the editors, editors sitting yes. in New York or DC or LA pitching out ideas. And there's that real tension because you have um, you know you have these editors who have I mean they have a sense of what the readership wants. And you have this great line, you know, um, uh, this explained, if I, can, if I may just read this. I'm um, impressed that you have this ready to go. Wow. <laughs> um, uh, uh, China reporting tended toward extremes, leading to stories capturing either the awful or the enchanting. This, this explained why an editor at a hallowed American news magazine advised me, an article from China requires an ending that makes the reader feel either we're all going to die or we're all going to get laid. So I, of course, this, you know, this has been triple dog-eared um, here. Oh, do you have this experience working for a hallowed uh, news publication? <laughs> I was you. Does, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I don't want to make you name names, yeah. but I was very curious about, you know. Um, but, 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 but that tension, you know, still persists. I mean, it's an open, I mean, it's, it's not a secret. That tension persists to that day, to this day. And, you know, from, from the editor's perspective, it's really about what the readers want. They don't, you know, they want something that can catch eyeballs, especially in the digital age. Mm-hmm. And they want something, they want a story that um, that captures change, that says, read this because you need to know this because this is how, this is, this is important and this is how China's changing. Mm-hmm. But so much of what goes on when you're on the ground in China is so much more complicated. And in many ways, you know, the change that comes you know, doesn't make you want to, you know, at the end of the story, you probably are not wanting to die or get laid. I mean, that's, you know, that's, that's, that's the unfortunate truth. But how do you, um, how did you grapple with that? Well, what's hard too is that China's not monolithic. And Mm -hmm. I always, you know, that's a big thing I I find, I I worry when we hear our North Korean coverage for the same reason. Maybe North Korea is not a great example, but it's on my mind when I read things because reporters only get to go to Pyongyang. And we've all read that story. It's a variation of that story every time. And I always think, why don't you just sit down in a hotel lobby and just record who's walking by? What shoes are they wearing? Just something, just try to do a different angle on it, right? And I know they're constricted. but And in China, for a long time, it was that way, too. You couldn't get out to the countryside to do Mm -hmm. reporting. And and reporters are harassed all the time in China. Mm -hmm. Um, But in this book, you know, I talk about going to, like, discovering that China has a border. And I don't think, I think in the States, when we think of a border and we think of immigration, we think of of two countries or maybe a third or fourth. But China has 14 countries around its border. Mm. It's got the most countries around the world. The border with North Korea is 800 miles long, Mm. which is, you know, is from San Diego to where Big Ben Park is in Texas. I mean, these are enormous. And when I started going out to like the Burmese border or the Bhutanese border or India, Nepal, Korea, and you start seeing the influx of people, and then you think, well, wait a minute, officially, 
China only has 538 refugees, right? <laughs> That's the number being processed.、Mm-hmm. Trump wants 50,000. You know, Obama wanted 110,000. Right now, China has 538 refugees being processed officially. But then you go to these borderlands, and there's people everywhere. Right. And you start thinking again about well, when we're talking about China, to use that tone again, what China are we talking about? And I even found like writing about Chinese agriculture. A rice farmer in the Northeast has a completely different economic model and life than a cotton farmer in Xinjiang or a pineapple grower in Yunnan, right? Right.、And、so it's hard to make these generalizations. Right. I mean, you know, the, the, what they always say about China is that it's a civilization masquerading as a nation, and they're so and. Um, and Sun Zhongshan, you know, the ch- shifting tray of sand. The shifting tray of sand. It's 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 very difficult to capture. And you're exactly right that anyone who actually cares enough to understand the country on a deeper level knows that it's it doesn't neatly fit into、um, a cover story for、mm-hmm. you know any of these.、Um, uh, uh, American publications that wants to make one specific point because、sure. all these points are always intertwined and some of them are you know not as sexy as、um, you know a headliner would like.、Um, so yeah. If I could say, I mean, when, when I worked at Time with Susie, there was a bureau chief there named Matt Forney, and he said to me one day, "You just got to know something about journalism in China." I said, "What?" He said, "There are no new China stories. There's only new China journalists." <laughs> I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "Look at the archives. We're going to do environmental reporting. We're going、right. to do human rights reporting. We're、right. doing women's rights reporting. These are all important topics. I'm not、right. saying these should not be covered.、Right. But he said, 'People come. Writers should write about what interests them.、Mm. If someone comes to Beijing or Shanghai or Chongqing for the first time, they see something. Well, I'm going to write about that.、Mm-hmm, you know, and、mm-hmm. my perspective, my experience in China would have been so much different had I landed in Beijing as a foreign、of、correspondent.、Right. You know, I mentioned in the book we were talking about this earlier." I learned Sichuan Hua, and I didn't know I was learning Sichuan Hua. I thought I was learning Chinese, and then I got to Beijing, and people did the like, "What are you, man?" It's like a Chinese person coming to Louisiana and learning, you know, "quote unquote" Southern English because I wouldn't say "duo xiao qian," I say "hao qian," and well, "bu zhi dao," no, "bu xiao ye," and "sa zhi mian," and all this stuff, you know. And I had this language thing that it was like so jarring for me too, of like, "shit, I'm not, I don't know this country as well," you know. So, and someone had said, I, "There's a famous linguist, John De Francis, said this: like asking a Chinese, per, asking somebody, 'Do you speak Chinese?' It's like asking a European, 'Do you speak Romance?'" I mean, I, that line struck me so deeply because I remember, you know, three years after learning English、um, in, in sixth grade is when you start taking a second language in、um, in, in, in many U.S. schools, and I、um, actually my mother picked up、uh, French for me, and I、um, realized that. Treating French as a different language than English, you know, f- friends of mine would say, "Well, you know, like I can speak, in- you know, French, or、um, like when、well, my mom grew up speaking French, like you're bilingual, I'm bilingual." But <laughs> you know, the relationship between French and English, and the relationship between English and Chinese, I mean, to, to, to put them on the same category of just a different language was patently absurd, and.、Uh, I would have that conversation, but it would always sound like I was on the defensive. Like, oh my, my, it's so much harder to speak Chinese. Like, yeah, you speak another language, and you know, it's it's, it's Spanish or French. I speak another language, it's Chinese. It's so much harder for me. But I, you know, when、Do、I you read Chinese is easier than English. I,、uh, I think it is. I it? think it's I I think. Grammatically, it's easier,、uh-huh. but I think you to get into the idioms、yeah. to 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 really.、Um, You know, to speak not just to be functioning, but、yeah. to speak for 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 to to、um, uh, uh, with a level, I think, of complexity. That sounds serious out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. By the way, this is what Sichuanese sounds like. I mean, this is Sichuanese. It sounds like. I mean, I remember again as a four-year-old, like adults would tell me, Sichuanese is basically like hookers babbling because it's like it's so dirty. It's like the what link. What did your parents do for you? <laughs> <laughs> and then you got to get new things. But it, it was so.、Um, it, but the language is so. Sichuanese is a dialect. It's very dirty, and the curse words like you know、um, uh, a lot of fucking, a lot of like cunts. It's so ingrained into basically the foundation of the language that. I mean, I even now, like when I hear Sichuanese, I feel like I'm doing some, like I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna kind of, you know, do something bad because、yeah. it's so,、um, it's, it, you know, it,、uh, you know, because though that the language is so kind of, you know, and and、uh, is woven with. 
Profanities. It's, it's funny you say that because I have a five-year-old who corrects my tones now, but he flinches often when Chinese is spoken to him because he's so used to being hectored in mm-hmm. Chinese. Mm-hmm. Shui uh-huh. You know what uh-huh. I mean? It's always these commands that I had to go out and find like Frozen, like Disney stories in Chinese. So I'm like, no, Chinese <laughs> can be fun too. Like Elsa can be in Chinese, you know, because he has that same mentality. Here's it from his grandmother and stuff, this, that cursing and that abruptness. Right. There's something quite harsh and kind of angular about it. It's beautiful. You don't think Sichuanese is beautiful? No. I, 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 think, I, think, I think this man on the stage is the, might be the only man on earth, I mean, Sichuanese included, who have described Sichuanese dialect as beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 it's many things, but it's, it's but beautiful. I was that. so relieved on the, on the 50th anniversary of Pu Tonghua last year, two years ago it was, when the education minister lamented that only 15% of Chinese can speak Putonghua correctly. You know what I mean? Oh, it's not just me. My introduction to Putonghua was sitting in a Tsinghua University classroom. Remember when we were kids and you would do those oral oral tests in school? You put your finger up if you hear a beep. They would sit and say, ma, ma, ma. And I'd have to sit and hold my fingers up. Which one? Because, again, for years I thought I was saying I like to read books, but I was saying I like to cut down trees. I wasn't saying kan shu, I was saying kan shu. Uh, uh, My tones were all wrong because of it. So for me, Mandarin is that prescribed, ugh, I don't like that. Whereas, Right, right, right. It's really just an, maybe my my saying Sichuanese is beautiful is what I'm more mean is that street talk is beautiful. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Yeah, there's, um, uh, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't date Sichuanese girls, right? Oh my gosh, the Peace Corps had three rules. So they were, oh, host country nationals, please. That was the Peace Corps talk. <laughs> um, you couldn't talk politics, you couldn't ride motorcycles, and you couldn't date locals. And honestly, no local would have wanted to date me. I showed up, <laughs> I looked so different than everybody else. The school didn't know what to do with me. And I remember my, the first time my dean saw me, he was like, basketball. I'm like, yep. He's like, we have a team. I'm like, good. And he's like, you can be on it. And I was like, I'm a foreigner. He's like, there's no rule that says foreigners can't be on the basketball team because no foreigners have been in Sichuan before. So they put me on the team, and that's what I did. Yeah. Right. Yeah, no one, there was no. No, no, no. no. But, um, you know. It's very lonely tears. Peace Corps <laughs> would give you, our medical kit in Peace Corps was like, it was like Hunter S. Thompson's lunchbox. It was like two syringes, some Gatorade, and a huge bag of condoms. And I remember just <laughs> laughing, like, ah, this is a good joke. And my students would blow them up, and we'd throw them around the room and stuff. Yeah, a very lonely two years. Um, well, <laughs> um, it turns out my students were the ones having all the sex. Right, right, I mean? right, right, As right. As a foreigner, I'm like, oh, they're all so, yeah. So I want to ask about that, because, so, I mean, this book, you know, in, is, 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 so, is so many ways um it's dedicated to your wife francis mm. and it's also the love story of you know of um how you and your wife met and how the relationship evolved and you also document um evolving chinese moray uh, mores when it comes to intimacy and love and you say when you first arrived like even holding hands You'd be right fine, yeah. you, you couldn't hold hands you couldn't i mean this is in, 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 in the uh mid 90s um and then you sort of saw that change when you were there you saw that gradually change what was allowed and um you know what was even um sometimes encouraged and And a burgeoning gay culture in beijing which i never expected to find you know these things all changed rapidly yeah how um what was that what was that like to encounter for you um was it I mean, I, just because I'm, I'm honestly curious. Well, I'm, you know, this is a funny thing. It's like we were talking earlier about your experience mirrored mine you know, mm-hmm. in the opposite direction. My wife had never dated a foreigner. She never brought a foreigner home. When my wife was a little girl, her mom would say, finish what's on your plate. There are starving people in America. You know, there was this, there was this flip thing going on. And she, you know, I have to say, and in the book I write about this, our families were a huge help because... Um, they never batted an eye about mm. this. And once your family supports something, you know, it doesn't feel so odd. Um, mm. In Beijing at that time, you know, there was always the eyes, the, the whispering grannies and aunties. And I learned, like, the worst thing you can do in China is, a, you know, find someone who's unhappy with a grudge. You know, you're in trouble, right? right? The right. resentment will steep like tea leaves around you. And so there was a time, like, in Beijing, where we would go around and, like, announce ourselves to the neighbors. Like, hello, right. I'm heroic eastern plum blossom and this is my you know girlfriend francis and and went through that but we were also helped and i read about this quite a bit in the book that we taught at a collaborative international school Mm -hmm. and what that meant is the students learned english and chinese language but they also learned english and chinese thought Mm. 
Mm -hmm. So we team taught with a, a, a counterpart, right? So I had a Chinese teacher in my classroom, and I would teach social studies. And I would teach the sixth graders in English, Rome was a mighty empire with great engineering. <laughs> and then my co-teacher in Chinese would say, Rome was built on the back of slaves. And she would tell it all in Chinese, right? And so we were in this environment anyway, mm. where we were constantly sort of mirroring one another. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It helped. Mm. Yeah. Because I, um, curiously, right, I, th I think we were there at the same time. I was in 98... Um, in 98 or 99, I returned to Beijing briefly. Um, I think I was a high school student to teach at, um, at a, to teach like a summer camp, um, at an English language summer camp. And the, one of the women um, fellow teachers, I think I was, I was 18, uh, yeah, I was maybe a little bit younger, and uh, she was 20 and she was dating a foreigner. And it was like, that was big news. Yeah. And that was, I, mean, I don't know if you felt this at all, um, but from the Chinese per perspective, again, there was this sense of, you know, suspicion about her intentions in dating a foreigner. Was it for a visa? Was it to um, basically seek a way still out still suspicious of, of that. <laughs> yeah, 20 years on. Yeah, no. um, a way to seek uh, a way out of the, um, the country. And also, um, but also, you know, she was very attractive and there was this sense, well, you know, because she's, you know, she's really attractive mm -hmm. and she's, you know, smart that she can land a foreigner. So there were all these you know, conflicting, um, but also, I think, very um, troubling kind of ideas about, you know, you know relationships, intimacy, and sure. also relationships, intimacy. What was that like with a uh, foreigner? On your end, did you think these are just incredibly kind of conservative, um, uh, backward people? I mean, what, 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 what was your... No, to be perfectly honest with you, the reactions were more in the state side of things. Than, hmm. You know, it's, it's interesting. And we... You know, I talk about this in the book, too. We were a couple, but she came to the States to go to university. We weren't married at that time. And my wife's a lawyer. And um, we sort of crossed paths in that while she was staying on in Berkeley and doing her law degree, I was in Beijing living in the Hutong, right? Mm -hmm. My wife can quote the Constitution, the American Constitution, left and right. I know more about the Chinese Constitution than she right. does. And so, again, that intimacy, that sort of, those paths sort of crossed, I guess is what I'm saying. It never mm -hmm. felt, I never felt that intrusion into my private life mm -hmm. the way that she does doing research in China. And I guess this hmm. is a question for you as we turn this over to the audience, too, like, She's, I can, as a, as a foreigner, I can go into a place and extract myself immediately if I get in trouble. Mm -hmm. My wife was sitting in courtrooms, you know, um, watching judges, and she was scribbling notes about how imperious the judge was and what a terrible word that you would use um, um, this person was, and they weren't following uh, protocols. And the judge looked up and said, hey, you can't be taking notes in here. And there's a plaque on the courtroom that says, you know, we, the judges have the right to arrest somebody. Right. And they took the notes and passed it up and all read them out. You know, and it was horrible. And she felt like, I'm a goner. And I don't have that relationship with China. I can extract myself from these things. Right. And so she feels it more, I think, when we're back in the country than uh -huh. I ever did dating or as a reporter or anything like that. That's, that's, that's interesting. I have one last question before yeah. we turn it over to the audience is, um, you know, uh, just even while we're chatting here, I can definitely, you have kind of a very um, animated sense of humor, and you are also in the book. I mean, it's very, you know, I really encourage, you know, everyone to, to get a copy. It's, it's very funny. I mean, I laugh out loud a lot. Um, but it, it's evident to me that that sense of irony and kind of the quippiness about you is just kind of part of who you are. And the Chinese, and you comment on this, the Chinese, especially in the early 90s, irony is not really a thing. Sarcasm is an American Sarcasm import. is yeah, a thing. Yeah. So I, and when I, and, and when I'm there, sometimes I can feel this profound loneliness. Like when mm. someone says something, I mean, the, you know, there's this um, uh, uh, great passage when, um, you know, you're, when you're teaching in Sichuan and um, the school refuses to fix uh, the shower for you, so you're being shocked every single time you take yeah. a shower and it goes on for a year. And finally, I think one of the teachers comes and says to you in a very kind of deadpan, like, you know, um, uh, 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 a officious, yeah. officious way, 
you know, this, you know, the shower will not kill you. And he, right. he, he's co- being completely serious about it. Right. But and, and it's a moment that you just want to be like, like you, like, you know, I would imagine you would want to sort of laugh with him, even if he's not able to shower. Like, oh, I often did. Yeah. Um, so, so what was that like? Cause there, there, there must <laughs> what was be, that like? Yeah, there, because there's so many things. I thought I was just, the one who was crazy the whole time. It turns out it was all of them. <laughs> it's funny, though, you know, I've been one of So I studied um, writing at Berkeley with Maxine Hong Kingston, who's a, a Chinese-American writer. Some of you may know the woman wore and, right. and China man. And she told me, like, you've got to be really careful with humor when writing about a foreign culture because some people won't get it and they'll be offended by it. Mm-hmm. And I thought, we used to talk about this. I'd say, well, how come we can write books about France and there could be like a zany farmer, you know, <laughs> or the Polish handyman, like think of right. Under the Tuscan Sun. There's sort of tropes in these books, especially set in Europe or in the Western United States or in Mexico. Chinese people are funny. They're naturally funny. And one of the things, if you're living in a totalitarian state, Humor gets you through the day often. And I, I find it, it's funny, when the Beijing book come out, came out, I'm speaking Chinglish there, when the Beijing book <laughs> came out, um, when the Beijing book came out, I'm quoting people I'm living with in the Hutong, and they have a very dry sense of humor. I remember the New York Times critic said, Meyer often makes fun of his characters. And I thought, <laughs> you haven't been to China. You know, there's, there's great empathy for these people, uh-huh. in fact, not, not making fun. Uh-huh. So. But, but 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 more to your experience. I'm glad you laughed. <laughs> <Good>. <laughs> you, you got um, you got someone who, one person at least who gets <laughs> it. Um, but uh, I mean, but but was that frustrating? What? Just the New York that, Times critic? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> that um, you know before you know before before dating your wife that you would have so many of these moments where you just. Because for me, I mean, when I go back to China, and I often, from Chinese officials or from yeah. um, people who are trying to, you know, especially, you know, party officials or even just, you know, uh, people who are trying to do things by the books, like they're saying something that's like painfully false. Uh, yeah. And they're saying it kind of with a deadpan expression on, on, with, on their face. And you, I would think just for my, for my sanity and also just for kind of my like sense of comfort like if we could at least laugh about it yeah. then we could move on but it's very lonely when you're looking at this thing and 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 and, and, and you feel like you're saying to me black is white but you're not even like you know you're not even acknowledging that at least, you know like fine like if you don't want to address this problem that, that that's yeah. okay but at least we can be in on it but you know they're you know <laughs> but you know writers sort of occupy this sort of free zone in China in some ways and that you're forgiven if you laugh. I'm thinking of Lao Xia and I'm thinking of people mm-hmm. historically who use a lot of satire. So I remember, so my reaction to that, and we'll turn to audience questions here, maybe this is a lead-in for that, is I would laugh. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Because I'm the foreigner. Mm-hmm. I can get away with it. And I remember one time talking to a Beijing official and it was about urban planning in Beijing and the shape of the city and what was coming to resemble Houston and Los Angeles. And I said, you don't have to make the same mistakes America made. And he got really upset. And he said, we have every right to make the same mistakes that America <laughs> made. And I burst into laughter. And it was really funny to see the look on his face. And then we went on and talked something else. But it's uh-huh. a great quote, you know. But, yeah, maybe I'm the boorish Lawai. I don't know. But I, I think um, there's a lot of humor in this book. You're right. I think there's a lot of humor in China, period. Mm-hmm. There's also things that aren't so funny, which maybe we'll talk about. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. But, uh, I, I'd just like to turn, I'm curious, we can talk about anything about China. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, sure. Hello, my name is Morgan Jones, US China Strong. Hi, Morgan, can you get the microphone? Yeah, cool, no problem. Uh, hello? Cool. Hi. Whoa. Uh, my name is Morgan Jones from the US China Strong Foundation, and uh, Michael, uh, John Holden sends his regards. He told me about here and said great things about you as well. Um, first question for you is, uh, for someone who is... Uh, you know, first time ever going to China, for instance, um, and I lived there for six years myself, but uh, what would be some of the things that you'd want to tell them and let them know about before they ever go to China based on your 10-year experience there? And then would you ever move back to China uh, at some point? What do you think your expectations would be in terms of moving back over to China if you were to do that at all? Yeah, I'd say the first thing is go someplace in the countryside. I mean, like if you're going to study Chinese, go to Harbin, which isn't the countryside, but it's outside of a city that correspondents report on. I would go somewhere where you can sort of start fresh and find your own way. Um, The second thing about going back, you know, it's funny. After we left, we were in Berkeley and then we were in New York and we came back. We lived in Hong Kong and then Singapore after our son was born. And this has been a topic of conversation. You know, when do we go back? How do we go back? Where do we go back? 
Uh, that's an ongoing conversation, to be honest with you. We live in Pittsburgh now. Pittsburgh has a, a very active Chinese community. They have a very large Sunday Chinese school. Lots of people at Carnegie Mellon you know, doing robotics mm -hmm. and at Pitt doing biotech and stuff. Great Chinese food, the best Chinese food I've had in North America outside of Flushing. Um, Pittsburgh, huh? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's the new Beijing, I'm telling you. <laughs> when do we get that Amazon <laughs> you headquarters? You heard it here first. Look out. I love it, yeah. So, um, but that's, that's a real question. And where do you go with a kid? How do you introduce that person? Well, my wife would go back with me to the village she grew up in, in Jilin province, near the North Korea border. You know, we, for the Manchuria book, I said, like, she quit her job here in New York at a, at a big firm, all gung-ho, I'm going to move back with you to my home village, yay! And we landed, and she lasted a week. She was out of there. She said, I'm, they're treating me like a Chinese girl again. No respect for my, my um, lawyer. You know, you can't be a lawyer in this environment and so forth. And so that's a concern we have, yeah, thinking about that. What language do you guys speak in, out of curiosity? It depends on if we're arguing or not. If we're arguing, it's in Chinese. If it's everything else, it's, it's a why, mix. Yeah. Why? Just because it's more fun to argue in Chinese, I think. Yeah. Is it more colorful um, yeah. Uh, uh, profanities? Yeah. Okay. All right, good she's to know. a don't bear in too, so she's really oh, good. Oh, oh, yes, she's in. I'll show you the colors. <laughs> I always like that one. Anyone? Yeah, hi. Ben, ben Moore. Um, I, I wanted to uh, mine your comment a little deeper about humor in China. Yeah. Because I think we have two giant countries with two giant, one giant and one super giant population that are feeling nervous about each other. And I think that to some extent we need to go around the backs of our respective leaders and joke with each other as much as we can. Mm -hmm. And your first book kind of led me into the, I mean, I mean, there's a passage where you're, the Olympics are coming up in Beijing and you've got a class of adults that you're talking with and you start going off the rails with the program presentation and the adults seem to be absolutely getting it and loving it. And yeah. so when somebody says there's a lack of humor, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that, you know, they're like the Weibos or this seething pit into which you don't want to fall. And I'm thinking there's all kinds of black humor, dour humor, dry yeah. humor. And I was wondering if you could kind of tease that out a little more because i kind of relying on it as a resource. Do you think that's true, by the way? I make this contention. I find it, the senses of humor to be really similar. I think Mark Twain and Lausha are sort of spiritual cousins as writers. I, I, I actually, um, yes, maybe Lao Shui, mean, maybe you can find, you can certainly find um, uh, parody and irony in literature, but on the whole, and I'm just speaking personally, whenever I go to China, um, the, com you know, my, you know, my humor is, to is, is, is quite casual and self-deprecating and it's it's a bit like you that I, it, I can't help it it kind of just it kind of it just uh, you know swells out of me and in China I find at least in everyday conversation um, that sort of casual you know uh, self mockery and kind of mockery of just the circumstances that we find ourselves is definitely it, it's muted. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what that what, what what that experience is like for you. And keep in mind well, when yeah. I you know when I'm there, um, especially when I'm speaking Chinese, and if, if I don't make a point of saying I'm a foreign reporter and I grew up in the West, um, people just take me for a local. So the conversation very like so so you know they it's very much you know I think they're engaging me at that level. Oh, you're just a you know a local girl from Sichuan, right. um, and uh, it's. I think when I've tried to kind of goad them a little bit with, you know, the self-deprecations and kind of, you know, to, um, the, the self-mockeries, they think I'm being a clown. Like, they think that I'm, you know, like a little bit weird. I wonder if it's a frontier prairie thing, too. What do you that, Well, I grew up in a place like where Garrison Keillor, you know, that folksy sort of humor. And China, so much of it is a frontier. I mean, I write about this a lot, going through Xinjiang and Tibet and Yunnan and the Northeast that I find th those, those things align quite well with one another. And Beijing people, that was my first entire, like Sichuan people, you can't say a bad thing about Sichuan or they'll punch you in the face, whereas Beijingers, the big slogan when I moved in the late 90s oh, was, right. you know, Ming Tian Hui Gong Hao, tomorrow will be even better. And Beijingers would say, well, it can only, get, you know, it'll be even worse was their, with their take on that. Um, you know, t tomorrow will be even better, but today things will only get worse is how mm -hmm. they would say it, because they had lived through Tiananmen, you mm -hmm. know. And so, 
there was that disconnect, maybe. I don't know. Right. I, I, I wonder, and I'm just thinking out loud here, if that wryness is, um, if there's just a touch of kind of cosmopolitan sophistication with that, because you have to have some distance to your circumstances to yeah. be able to, you know, evoke that sort of irony. If you're just trying to survive, then you probably don't have, you know, then everything's just serious and you're literally just kind of in, in, in battle mode. I will say that I was so shocked and, and nonplussed one day. I walked into the Beijing's largest bookstore, which is the largest bookstore in China, and the best-selling book was by Woody Allen. Hmm. And I thought, what? And I started translating it, and I knew one of the words. I was like, Mensa, Mensa whores. You know, and that was a, a really big seller in the early 2000s. So they have that sense of humor there. Sure. Right, right, right. Yeah. Anyone? Yes. Oh. Hi, my name's Charlie. Um, I have a question about, like, your language learning process mm -hmm. and how as you because you, you you went to the country and you didn't know any Chinese right and then you stay there for a long time and I'm curious as you learned more Chinese um, could you talk could you talk a little bit about how that changed your thinking and how maybe <laughs> and this is kind of a when you encountered situations at first, recall when you weren't speaking much Chinese, but then maybe right. encountered them years later with much more like ability and context. I'm just curious to, to learn about that process. It's a really good question because we all see a foreign land through the prism of our own interests. So if I were an economist, my take on China would have been quite different. I like history. Um, so it started with writing things on my arms, and I would look like Spider-Man, you know, walking into stores saying Pijo or Quan Xuan Shui, trying to read that. Um, and then it evolved, and the way, the real click for me was I was a Blakemore Fellow. If any younger students here are interested in a free ride to study Chinese, look at the Blakemore Foundation. It's this wonderful Seattle-based foundation that paid, uh, they pay you for a year. You can go to Taipei, you know, to, to a university there or in Beijing. Um, and what I did there was I went to a bookstore in Beijing, and I found urban planning texts and history texts. And then I had one-on-one -on -one tutoring where I was reading those books and learning that way, right? So and the other thing I started doing was I would take the Beijing Wanbao, the daily newspaper, and pick one article and just trans, you know, um, translate it uh, as well I could. So that my interest became more around writing the Beijing book and looking at history and urban planning. So I found it helped rather than having conversations about Taiwan has long been a part of China. You know what I mean? Some of these primers that you get are pretty dry. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it changed me. And then it got me into the archives then. And my deepening of the history got, got um, deeper and deeper, if that makes sense. Yeah. Hi, I'm Zach. Hi, Zach. Uh, I was wondering if you're reading any Chinese authors that you think are particularly influential or revealing now. <laughs> It's a really good question. I went to Taiwan um, last fall. Taiwan's a whole separate book, by the way. We haven't even touched on that yet. But um, in Taipei, they had, for the first time, a global Chinese literature conference at the National Library there. And it was me, and it was three contemporary Chinese nonfiction writers. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really interesting listening to their experiences writing, because the agenting culture and the book advance culture is all quite nascent in China. You know, you used to just get a cash advance in a bag, um, and people wouldn't really track your sales and so forth. It's very difficult, too, and I wonder if you've run into this with contemporaries, where I think one of the reasons a lot of foreigners have done the nonfiction writing rather than native Chinese is if you're a single child kid, policy kid, mom and dad need to be taken care of, you can't leave your work unit and go live in a village for two years and hope a publisher will give you money for that, or that it will pass the censors. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other thing, too. Um, and so it was really neat, for lack of a better word, my Minnesota and me, it was neat to meet authors who were trying to do this. And one was um, Hong Ling. I don't know if you've read her writing at all. No, I haven't. I'll show you. Actually. Okay. But there are people who are starting to do it. So other than that, to be honest with you, I, I read a lot of 1930s authors. I really like that generation. And before that, my favorite dynasty to read about is the Song Dynasty writers because they're chronicling their, their culture as it's disappearing, as the mm. Mongols are coming in. So they're writing down recipes and how to do plants and everything else, you know. Mm. Yeah. Do you read anything online? Uh, like Nanfang Jomo used to be the go-to, Southern Weekend and stuff, and all right. of it's gone now. I mean. Yeah. I mean, I was just going to say that I think it's um, – I just wrote a story um, – 
it's in the process of being edited about about Chinese youth, um, kind of this post '90s generation and their relationship to the digital world um, and their kind of interests in culture. And I have to say, I was very, um, I was left very demoralized um, mm. in that not many of them, I mean, even ones who um, have graduated from Beida, which is like the Harvard of China, Zhongwenxi, which is the China, like it's literature. It's the Pasadena City College of China. I mean, you know what I mean? I always think it's unfair to compare it to Harvard. It's not that great, you know what I mean? But yeah. It's, it. um, it's the elite, it's, it's the but most it isn't that it's equal for the humanities. As right, it's like the most prestigious, and it's it's in, and their best department is the Chinese, is the yeah. you know literature department, and the you know the gra the graduates are I mean they're looking out jobs in you know global PR companies, which to me I mean just seems like the most like like yeah. a real soul sucker. I mean, no offense to any. P I mean, PR, it, it just, it, <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, it's going so well. I, I yeah. um, uh, but it just, I, I guess the disconnect <laughs> is, you know, if you study communication, I can, I can see why you would go into that. But if you are getting a PhD in ancient Chinese yeah. literature, and I ask them, why do they do this? And they say, well, you know, it, it's good job, good yeah. benefits, you know, it kind of is vaguely related to kind of communications humanities. But I think the drive or, you know, for so many of us who write nonfiction, I mean, we don't do it for the fat paychecks. At least I don't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you might be. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, but you do it for the love of writing yeah. and for the subject matter and because there's a real sense of purpose. And I think for a lot of Chinese, because there's censorship and because there are just so many other kind of economic reasons for why this just is yeah. unappealing, you know, as I'm a glad career you, choice. I'm glad you bring up the economic reasons. I used to look at like Beijing. People think, oh, Beijingers don't care about their history. Ah! Ah, they're tearing it all down. Well, if you look at urban planning and policy and how zoning works and financing and everything else, there's some reasons behind the way Beijing uh, is shaped the way it is. And I found now I'm getting at Pitt um, Chinese students coming to do an MFA. Mm -hmm. There are no MFA programs in China. There's one at Zhongshan University oh, yeah. in yeah, the yeah. south. City uh, University used to have one in Hong Kong that was shut down. So there isn't that mill that mm -hmm. we have in the States where if you want to go spend three years writing and learning how to teach and stuff, you can go to that. So I think that might be another reason. Right. Yeah, but I am seeing more students. And it's really funny to watch them in workshop talk about like going to a psychiatrist in Beijing. This is a new thing, right? Going to therapy. And the students around them are just amazed at these stories, you know? And right, the, right, the person right. writing is like, is this special? Yeah, because yeah, Because she yeah. or he doesn't have that immediate, they don't understand how interesting these things are to Westerners. So it's almost like they're finding their audience still. That, I don't that, think it's a coincidence like Wang Xiaobo is still very famous or very popular for fiction in China. Right, right, right. there's an audience for that. And I think right. for nonfiction writers, it's harder to gauge, what's your audience? Right, there's that. And it's I, muckraking always, but... Right. I, I also... Um, I also think that uh, for a lot of, uh, especially, I think this is happening in the post '90s um, uh, generation. You know, they have, I think, a greater sense of, you know, individual desires and um, goals, and you know, their parents are um, generally wealthier and are, are able them able to send them to kind of the Pitt MFA programs. But a lot of, I mean, I don't know what your experience is like with your students, but. Some of the younger Chinese um, that I've met, their opinions um, about China are, you know, are very polarized. Almost like the way that you know the editors, um, uh, yes. um, you know, the, I the, find the same thing. Um, I, hate it, hate it, hate it, or defend it, defend it. Defend exactly. It. Yeah. And all you're trying to do, I mean, in the few workshops I've taught, is to encourage them towards some complexity or kind yeah. of, you know, that they don't have to stay to these extremes. But I think for them, it's almost, there's a, almost a moral imperative. It's like, I either have to defend my motherland to, you know, you traitor, yeah. or um, no, there's nothing good about China. It's yeah. all bad. I can't believe I lived there for so long. Like, everything in the U.S. is so much better. And, you know, and, 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 and so much of writing is, you know, antithetically, like, you write because you are trying to mine kind of for, yeah. you know, subtleties beyond um, that sort of, you know, sc those sort of screeds. As you were talking, I'm realizing that my Chinese MFA students have been infected and that now they're all writing about their mothers. <laughs> <laughs> and the MFA students love to write about their moms. So I'm getting some of that. But they can still, I just keep telling them, well, make it a research piece about your mom. You can go deeper about right, this. Yeah. Right, right, right. They're never happy stories about moms, <laughs> the MFA students. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. 
I don't, I don't think that there's any paucity of Chinese students coming here, although with the wild card of Trump, who knows what is going to happen. But I do know the statistics are not good now for American students yeah. going mm -hmm. to China. They have dropped dramatically. And, you know, some experts have said, well, it's all the stories about pollution. Right. Mm -hmm. But um, at this moment, given where these two countries are, I find it extremely worrying that we are not putting an emphasis on yeah. getting more students from here, there. I agree. It's, it's, I'm really glad you brought this up. Some, two things have sort of converged, I think, in the last 10 years. One is that now China's, you know, the tail is wagging the dog, as it were, when it comes to like sustainable energy investment or a push to, for electric cars. You know, China's investing three times as much money as America is. So that's happening on that one direction. On the other direction, you're absolutely right. When I first got there 20 years ago, the flow was all going that way. It was American students who couldn't wait to learn Chinese. It's the language of the future. Have to learn this culture. Um, and now it's completely the opposite. And a third of international students in the US are now Chinese. And I know at my university, welcome. Take, we'll take your check. And mm -hmm. some of these students, I'm not exaggerating, come in and they have a kind of thuggish guy sitting with them in class who never does any work. And it turns out that he's been assigned by mom or dad to come over and kind of watch them in class, right? But it doesn't matter. The university doesn't have the money. And, and that's great that they're coming this way. But you're right. Even though the visas have gotten so much easier, it's drying up going the other way. And one of the reasons I wrote this book, actually, is I'm shocked at how few of my students and students at Carnegie Mellon, and I just spoke at Berkeley two weeks ago with their safe spaces and USC um, and Columbia, how stressed American undergraduates seem to be right now. When I was a student 20 years ago, going to college was about freedom, and now it feels like it's more about safety. And I don't know if it's because they're in debt, if they're scared about their career, if, like you said, they're not going to Vietnam. I keep thinking, well, is there another country they're going to? Um, there's 120 Peace Corps volunteers now in China. That every year they come, and your son is one of them, right? So that's nice. And those demographics have changed. They have married gay couples that serve now, uh, many more women, people of color, very different than my group. But overall, you're right, those numbers of students going to China have dropped. And I honestly don't know the reason. Is it because they're so in debt they feel like they can't make that leap? Do they feel that China's been written about and that ship has sailed? Hmm. I don't know. You know, Peace Corps has mm -hmm. just opened up in Burma, and they're opening up in Vietnam, too. And I'll tell my students, like, what an opportunity you have. Mm -hmm. Not interested in going. Do you have any idea? Does anybody else have any uh, thoughts on why that might be? Yeah, in the back. Sorry. Let her. She's. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, my name is Jerry, and Hi. I spent four years living in Nanjing mm -hmm. um, from 2010 to 2014. I will actually just wanted to pipe in on behalf of my friend Morgan, who was here, and he made a comment earlier, but he had to leave. Um, the U.S. China Strong Foundation is actually working on this problem actively. Mm -hmm. um, so they are trying to not only encourage and facilitate more and more young Americans to go to China to study Chinese, um, they're actually focusing on underrepresented demographics of uh -huh. United States citizens. Um, for example, ethnic minority groups and uh, sort of the, the folks that you don't normally see in China. Right. Um, based on my experience, I moved to China for a job um, straight out of grad school. And my four years while I was there, I encountered tons of Americans, I felt, mm -hmm. that were coming out of economic necessity. Um, these are, you know, recently under uh, recently graduated bachelor's degree holders, and again, 2010, they were kind of like, well, I didn't want to move home <laughs> to sleep on my parents' couch. Yeah. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. So, so they went to China, and some of them, you know, they're thriving there, mm -hmm. and they've started up their own companies and things like that. So that's something to consider, also. It's interesting too because, like, the early Peace Corps groups, a lot of those people stayed. You know, the current NPR correspondent, the, one of the New Yorker stuff, you know, probably read Peter Hessler's work and stuff, that there was a group, Jay Cooker was a Peace Corps volunteer, he won the last Pulitzer for the New York Times. Um, the, and I find later groups, even though these numbers have increased so much, they're not staying or they're not staying in visible roles. And maybe you're right, maybe they're there. They're just working in web technology or QR code production or something else that we don't see. Yeah, mm. yeah. I wanted to make one comment based on what you were talking about. 
Um, I think maybe there's also a sense that in China now there are less opportunities for foreigners as well because predominantly now you have the high guy that moved back and they can yeah. take a lot of the roles that foreigners used to fill. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Um, now to my question, we talked about the young generation, but obviously the old generation has gone through a lot of change over the years. And how are they processing it? Processing it? How how are they dealing with it? Do you have any insights on that? Um, I uh, it's it's a good question, and I had always um, I had always believed. Uh, perhaps maybe in a prejudiced way that the older generation who had been through so much um, in the last, you know, 80 years would be very conservative and incredibly, um, almost, you know, to, 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 to a certain extent, you know, feudalistic. I mean, some of them kind of, you know, crazy red in that, you know, we have to stick by the party. But that, that, the fundamentally, the thinking might be still quite kind of off the old guard. And I'm heartened by the variety of, um, you know, human experiences that have come out of um, just, you know, 80, 100, 100 years of very turbulent um, political history. I mean, I remember... Um, uh, a few months ago when I was speaking to a party official who I did not expect a lot of kind of enlightenment um, uh, from, say that uh, he really did believe that, you know, of course, individualism and freedom are values to be, you know, worked toward. And even though, you know, he, um, he he's a retired communist official and did not go so far as to sort of, you know, condemn the, 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 um, the shrinking civil society and kind of all the other things that, you know, the Xi Jinping regime has brought in. I, I, I was, you know, he, I think he's 65, and he talked about kind of his experiences, you know, entering the party as a 16-year-old and kind of working up through the chain. But, but um, he clearly had a sense of where China was lacking, how ossified, um, its institutions have become, and how um, rule of the law has to be, you know, that's, that, that must be a goal um, to be worked toward, even if it is, um, you know, not realized at this point. And I was surprised because a 65-year-old, um, I really thought he might have just, as many people have been through trauma or, um, uh, you know, terrible poverty, some of them are just want to bunker down and survive, and they're not really looking toward, you know, kind of idealistic lofty goals. But in him, I saw that, you know, he, 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 he very much had an idea of what China should strive towards, even if, you know, it's, um, it's, it's uncertain how it might, you know, get there in the end. I find if you go to church, the majority of people in the pews are elderly. If you go on a Buddhist retreat, the majority are elderly. Anytime I've met an interesting local historian who's trying, you know, all Chinese museums tell stories, but they're always political stories. Anytime I find somebody who's doing something different, well, Japanese civilians perished here. We should have a monument for that as well. They were also <laughs> victims of the war. It's almost always an older person. And I'll often ask people, like, why are you the ones doing this? Why are you the ones advocating for change? And I say, well, the, the young people are finally getting these gains. They don't want to lose them. Right. And so we can well, tell them about point. these things, but no one is going to, you know, it, uh, this is a long way of saying I'm amazed after 22 years since I first got there that the party is not only in power still, but so entrenched, you know, mm. even more so than it felt like in the 90s with Beijing Spring and Bill Clinton going there and everything. Mm. Um, and I think it's people often say, well, the younger generation doesn't want to let go of what they've gained. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm also surprised on that note, too, that land reform hasn't advanced, you know, that in the countryside, mm -hmm. farmers are still stuck. They yeah. can't mortgage their land. They can't sell their homes. Mm -hmm. They don't enjoy what the urbanites, you know, uh, enjoy. And, and I find the countryside is elderly. The cities are younger. Mm -hmm. And that chasm just gets wider and wider, yeah. that divide. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the back. Um, I guess in that oh I'm, I'm Jamie. Hi Jamie. Um, I guess in that same vein, I was wondering if um, if the sort of like internal migrations from rural areas to sort of like factory work in the city um, was it all like visible um, when you were there in rural areas? 
Yeah, and not, it was really visible in Sichuan because my students were the first group in 95. I had the paid students. They weren't, pay, they weren't getting tuition from the state. So they were free to go to Shenzhen and Dongguan. You know, we hear these whispered tales of someone making shoes and making 2,000 yuan a month when a teacher would make 500. What I observed in Manchuria when I was in the village is all of a sudden it flipped now where the policy became bring the city to the countryside. And so you have like, there's this number now of urbanization in China where they say that the population is majority urban. It's 60%. Well, what really happened is if you look at municipal boundaries, cities just got bigger. So like Jilin City, this little town up in Jilin province, its border all of a sudden became 50 miles mm -hmm. bigger on the circumference, right? And it's absorbed, it's stopped people from going into the cities. They're saying, well, now we'll appoint teachers to come out to your village. You can move into apartment buildings. You become urbanites, right? And that acceleration is happening a lot more now. It's still, you know, there's still a two-tier system. So if you're a migrant worker who comes to Beijing or Shanghai, your child, she can only go to school up until grade six, and then she has to go back to the middle school, high school in the home village. And so it's funny now, it's like the other way around. And I find more young people, I don't know if you find the way, this way too, People want to move to Chongqing and Chengdu. Yeah. Why would I move to Beijing or Shanghai? I can't afford a house. I'll never get a job yes. there. I should be out in Ningxia or something that you would never think about going to I was before. just in Ningxia. Really? Uh, I don't boring? know. I mean, the, 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 air is, um, the air is a lot better. The air was the, always terrible. Though, um, the, yeah. No, it's, um, but yeah, there is that sense that you know, there's kind of the, the first tier cities, you know, Beijing and Shanghai are oversaturated, um, and that the second in the second, like Hangzhou, you know, the second tier cities that are just a little smaller, but still has, I think, many of the you know, amenities of the you know, bigger cities um, are places where you have kind of, um, you may have a, a chance of, you know, developing and buying a house and, you know, and then. That's why we moved to Pittsburgh. <laughs> <laughs> I used to live on Central Park West. <laughs> Even Astoria is out of my range now. Yeah. yeah. I think I'm getting the. Oh, I'm one more the... question. We have one more question. Okay. Oh, they really cut you off. Oh my God. Yeah. Do you want to just? I'll stay after and talk. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, hello. Hi. Oh my gosh. So I, the Beijing book was banned for many years and I thought it was because it's about a sensitive topic, the destruction of old Beijing. The official word came down, it was because the Taiwan um, portion of the map was shaded differently than the mainland so they couldn't have it. <laughs> uh, whether that's true or not, I don't know. I would have teaching graduate school at Hong Kong University. My best journalism student from Sichuan, from Mianyang, she translated the beginning of that book without telling me and started sending it to publishers. Um, and she actually said there's an interest for this, right? And it's a very funny arc that's happened now in that I have, I think, probably more Chinese writers in a way than I do American readers. And one of the nice things about this, though, like with the Beijing book, is like I'll go to Stanford and the students will be reading that book in English. They'll be linked by video to students at Beida, at Peking University, reading that book in Chinese. Mm. And so there's a conversation going around that book. And... The book I thought was about the destruction of old Beijing, but now in China it's often written about as, here is an example of why we need affordable housing in cities. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's not about the Chang of the destruction of the Hutong. Mm. Just like the Manchuria book now is seen more of like, this is what agribusiness is doing to small town farms. You know, it's changing. So the perspective is really different. Yeah, and I have to say on censorship, I've been, I don't know, whistling past the graveyard or what, I've been very, very fortunate um, in that, there hasn't been red line cuts to the point where the translator said, like, we can't put six Leo Se, June 4th, the, the Tiananmen Massacre date. We'll put the two days after June 2nd. I mean, <laughs> she was playing games like that. They still catch it. But there's yeah. ways you can talk around it. And, of course, as a foreigner, it's very different for me, you know, uh, having these books out than a Chinese writer. Right. But, yeah, it's been a very interesting experience. And it's been wonderful um, seeing characters in those books come back to me and say, like, I want my picture in the book. You know, I want my real name used, that sort of thing. It's been a positive change. And yeah. I have to say, yeah. I mean, um, just the last comment. Having a, I think having a name like Michael Mayer really um, is to your, to your, to your, to your great... 
great benefit, and can I tell you why? Why they think it's Stephanie Meyer? No, no, from no. Twilight? Because because、I've、whenever because whenever I um not for the I, I, not perhaps not the reasons you guys are thinking because. Whenever I go on Chinese websites、um, uh, or、um, Weibo, I get so <laughs> there. It's a real downer for me because it's like, you know, Zhai Yang Fan with a、uh-huh. name like Zhai Yang Fan. You know, I thought she would actually have something insightful to say about China, but she's written all this rubbish, and she's Chinese, and I can't believe a Chinese person would you know be so like demented. And it's just you know, and and then it would be like you know. In, co- in contrast, you have you know Pete Hessler and you know、uh, Michael Mayer, and you know these are these are white Americans, and they are so much more insightful, and you know, and it's this great like you know, I mean, it's this real sense of like you know, with a name like Jia Young Fan, you have to like you have to sort of like hit it, you know, like you have to sort of really, really. Know what they're expecting, or like why they think like you know my stuff is so shitty. But there's but 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 I think you know like you know with a name like Evan Osnos, like just you know there's some some sense that you are writing with this great impartiality, and that you are you are making this commitment to burrow into the country. And I'm a total fraud because like I'm Chinese, like I, I you know it, which is weird. Like I'm Chinese, I should know it. Like in some just. Deeper, like even more, like significant way, and I failed. If it makes you feel any better, no one in 22 years of my experience in China has called me insightful to my face. <laughs> It's always the <laughs> booming by the Bu Tai Liao Jie Zhongguo, Zhongguo Yu Wu Qian in the Leisher, on and on and on. So that's flattering to hear, but I, I doubt it. I know every synonym for moron and idiot in Chinese and Sichuanese. I've heard them all. Yeah, maybe on that note, that's、I'm、a good、that. place to end. <laughs> Thank you for coming. <laughs>